four, three, five images of the same source in different parts of the sky. Now, the wonderful thing is that we actually do detect these amazing lensing events when one uses large telescopes. Here's an example of a gross magnification of a background galaxy viewed through a foreground cluster. And one also sees multiple images uh, which show very clearly uh, the gravitational lensing features that I've described. But how can lensing be useful in astronomy, quite apart from testing Einstein's theories? Exactly, that's the question. Can we now use gravitational lensing as an astronomical tool? And the answer is there are two things we can do. Firstly, one can look, use a lens in the same way as one uses a lens in the laboratory. For example, if we can imagine getting some information about the focal length of the lens, the focusing properties of the lens, then one can use it to infer the distance. Imagine you've got a background source and it passes through a lens, it produces an image, and this is basically laboratory optics. Well, if one knows something about the focusing property of the lens, then just as if when we focus a 35 millimeter camera, one can read off the distance on that camera lens to a source without actually measuring its distance. So one can use a gravitational lens to estimate the distances to very, very faint galaxies. Now, we are very interested, as we've discussed, in knowing what are the properties of galaxies in the early universe. And so gravitational lensing through clusters uh, can be used as sort of natural telescopes to leapfrog to greater distances than would otherwise be the case. And the results seem to show that galaxies were much bluer in the past, and this is understood in terms of them having much more vigorous activity. Here's an example of how the technique can work. We basically have a cluster where one sees a giant arc in this particular cluster, and one also sees uh, some smaller distortions. Now we can model the location of these uh, distorted images somewhat precisely, and then we can infer what those images would look like if they were not distorted, and here's the crunch, we can also determine how far away they are. So this enables us to determine what the properties of quite a large number of galaxies are at very, very large distances, much further than we would be able to see without the advantage of gravitational lensing. And like I mentioned, this tells us that the galaxies a long time ago were very much more youthful uh, than they currently are. What else does it tell us? Well, the critical thing I think one is hoping for is some idea of what is the distribution of dark matter. And in this case, a very recent development has been the use of gravitational lensing to try and estimate uh, what a map of the dark matter looks like uh, in an intervening cluster. And the way this works is one takes a very deep image, and this requires very good conditions on the, using the largest ground-based telescopes, and we try to measure the systematic distortions in a very large number, maybe a few hundred or even a thousand faint galaxies, which can be regarded as a kind of wallpaper viewed through the cluster. It's difficult to actually see the distortion directly on the images. In some cases, one can do that. Generally, one has to analyze the data in the computer. But when one determines that distortion map, then one can analyze that map and get a, a, an idea of how the dark matter is distributed. And one can make a map of that dark matter and compare it with, for instance, the distribution of galaxies in the cluster. So one can see, for example, is the dark matter distributed in the same way as the matter that shines? And in a recent example, we went to the Canary Islands, to the William Herschel telescope there, and we did a, um, a very long exposure over several nights of a particular cluster, and we detected the uh, distortion of the background galaxies and used it to create a map of the dark matter. Now, in this comparison of these two maps here, the map on the left is the smoothed map of the galaxies that make up the cluster, and the map on the right is the, matter of the, is the map of the dark matter, which is deduced from the background galaxies and their distortions. And what one sees is that the dark matter is indeed distributed rather similarly to the material that shines. That's a very interesting result. There is an awful lot of dark matter, 50 to 100 times more than can be accounted for by the galaxies. But most importantly, at least on these scales, it's distributed relatively similarly. Well, you say there's an awful lot of dark matter, and I think it's generally accepted now. Mm. But um, how much altogether? Well, not enough, it would appear, at least from these preliminary observations, to halt the expansion of the universe. 
And this is, of course, something of an embarrassment because the theorists would very much like there to be enough dark matter to have a very simple, elegant universe which is in balance and just stops expanding at some point in the infinite future. But if these clusters are representative, it certainly doesn't look like there's enough dark matter within the volumes that we've currently probed with gravitational lensing uh, to, uh, to provide enough dark matter to slow down the expansion that much. Well, it's all fascinating work. Uh, what next? Well, the most interesting recent development has been um, the repair of Hubble Space Telescope. Now, I've mentioned that in order to detect these distortions, one needs exquisitely good conditions on the ground. And, of course, the great advantage of Hubble Space Telescope, particularly now it's been repaired, is that it is above the um, deleterious effects of the Earth's atmosphere. And the first pictures of clusters of galaxies since the repair mission have just come in. Here's one of them. Uh, it is a cluster which uh, was already known to have arcs and elongated images in it. But what is so exciting about this image is that the detail is present. Uh, and one can see arcs in great, great detail, much finer detail, internal structure, and so on, than was possible from the ground. The images from the ground did show, as I mentioned, that there are some arcs in this cluster, but uh, the HST, the Hubble Space Telescope images, enable us to verify which images are multiple and also enable us to see many more elongated features and get a much richer picture. Um, and this is, I think, going to be very, very important. So looking ahead, I would say that the biggest improvement now is going to be the combination of our experience from the ground and long exposures with Hubble Space Telescope, which will enable us to trace the distribution of dark matter in clusters and also say a great deal more about the distant regions of the cosmos. Well, I think we're all intrigued by the nature of dark matter. I mean, all kinds of theories about it. Is it material as makes up you and me? Is it locked up in low mass stars? Or is it something much more exotic? And I've heard the suggestions there too. What do you think about that? Well, many of my theoretical colleagues uh, would like it to be exotic material because this would lead to the simplest explanation uh, of the structure of the universe that we see around us. But I think it's the job of the observer to keep an open mind, and my view is that ultimately the, the answer to these questions will come from the observations. And so I think at the moment it's a very open question. And again, we have no idea really whether the universe will go on expanding forever. I mean, it's only in our own century that uh, Edwin Hubble proved that the universe is expanding at all. And will that go on indefinitely? Will the universe come to an end? And can you think this uh, gravitational lensing and dark matter research can help us in finding out the answer to that one? I don't think we can answer the question yet of whether the universe is going to ultimately collapse or expand forever. But what I think we have now got are the tools to answer those questions. Well, we've got to wait and see. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's newsletter time. If you want the latest newsletter, then send your stamp to this envelope to newsletter number 55, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London W12 70S. You can, of course, get the latest information by dialing the Sky at Night information line 0891 800 39 pence per minute cheap rate, 49 pence per minute other times, or you can dial up CFAX page 615. And um, when I come back next month, we're going to go on to an entirely different topic. Dr. Paul Murdin's going to join me, and we're going to discuss some very peculiar things indeed, planets of pulsars. So until next month, good night.